Uh, we are now joined by Rick Burke, who's running for uh, School Board District 2. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rick Burke, and I'm running for Seattle School Board Director Position 2. I'm honored to come before you today to share my experience and to try to earn your support and endorsement. So I was born in Seattle. I attended C SPS, and I chose it for my three kids. Uh, my wife was a Seattle classroom teacher. And I really believe in the public schools and will work super, super hard to ensure their future success. My Seattle Public Schools education prepared me for my engineering degree. Um, and now I manage an engineering and high-tech manufacturing firm that's located over in Inner Bay Area. So I'm running for school board because I truly believe I can make a difference. Um, education is a needy but really, really rewarding cause. For me, it started harmlessly, um, helping out in the classrooms. But then it grew to be PTA co-president and then to a leadership role in the statewide advocacy group, Where's the Math? Um, so I caution you to get involved, but I encourage you to get involved. <laughs> um, so along the way, I met some amazing people, and together we got to redefine the 2008 uh, state math standards and instructional materials. So my vision for Seattle schools is based on uh, three pillars, learning, customer service, and strategic schools. So my campaign slogan, let's get back to learning, means that we put student learning before everything else. It, it means that we focus on the teachers, the students, and the instructional materials. The customer service model is more than just sending newsletters. It's a paradigm change uh, where the district culture embraces students and community feedback as a tool for improvement rather than just calling it a nuisance. And then the strategic schools idea, that would be a grassroots mindset to really meet the needs of their communities. So look to the success stories, uh, Schmitz Park Elementary, Mercer Middle School, Rainier Beach High School. These homegrown success stories should really be the role model for the, the city. Thank you very much, and I hope I can earn your endorsement. Great, thank you. So now we have our four prepared questions that we're asking all candidates for school board, and you have a paper copy right there if you'd like to read along as we say it out loud. So I think we left off. Uh, Sarah, will you read number one? Certainly. What is your understanding of how the McCleary mandate will impact Seattle Public Schools, and what are your priorities for spending increased funding? So my understanding of how it will impact is that we're still in wait and see mode. There's going to be more money. We're almost certain. We're not sure exactly how much, and most people agree that it's not enough. Um, my priorities, as I indicated in my, in my platform, is really to get into the classrooms. Um, and that's through the teachers, through the instructional materials. Um, I think that the, uh, the priorities around that, um, you know, it's, it's, I understand that there's limitations around collective bargaining agreements, and getting that money to the teachers as, as salary is, um, that's more of a state level issue, um, but I would like to see maybe some of the more intangibles that make teaching a valuable career um, be funded, and some of the things that principals can do to make buildings more accommodating and more effective be funded, and some of the tools, materials, and support structures around professional development also be funded. Great. Uh, Renee, number two. What specific actions can the school board take to help assure equal educational opportunities and help close the achievement gap? Specific actions the school board can take. This is tough because the school board and the administration and the schools have been trying to do this for years. Um, what the school board can do is it can identify schools that have done this. And rather than letting the Seattle Times report on it or somebody else report on it, we can bring those schools into the fold and we can say, how did you do it? Share with us, share with your peers, let other teachers and, and administrators rotate through those schools that have had that success. Um, I think that's going to be a far more effective method than any sort of a top-down approach. Uh, Michael, number three. How do you view the role of a school board member in terms of district governance and curriculum? Do you have any issues with the current curriculum? This is one of my favorites. I'm, I'm kind of a curriculum guy. Uh, I 
you know, the, the thing that touches your student every day is the curriculum. And uh, the instructional materials that are used and how they're delivered is really critical in, in that learning. So I, I view my role as a school board director as that's one of my primary focus areas is to make sure that effective curriculum materials are adopted and that ineffective ones are exited. A really good example, if anybody has middle school students, the CMP2 program is um, going to be one of my pet projects to retire that one. It's about 10 years old, very poorly aligned, and it's really not serving our middle school kids in math. So the role of the board director in curriculum is to help guide the district towards good programs and try to limit the influence of publisher money. Um, in terms of governance, um, I understand the concept of governance, and it's interesting to see the, the public perception of governance versus micromanaging. Um, my role on the board would, would be to, would have to be to collaborate with my fellow board directors and create good policies. Part of that is also to create policy enforcement, which is one of the areas where I would like to improve. Great. Number four, uh, Maria. Both uh, locally and nationally, students, parents, and teachers have been pushing back against testing policy, including the frequency of testing, the subject matters tested, and the ways in which test results are used. What is your opinion about the current trend in testing policy and the resistance to it? This is a hot topic. Um, <laughs> I'll speak personally to it that I have an 11th grade daughter, mm -hmm. and we've opted out of the Smart Balance test uh, because I feel that, especially at 11th grade, it has no value to the student and it only has value to the testing companies. Um, so that's my implementation for my own family. Uh, from a scientist's point of view, as an engineer, I believe in the concept of testing. Everything that I build, I test. If I, cook a, if I make a recipe, you know, I want to test it before I feed it to my guests. So the concept of testing is completely sound, but the process that's being used, you know, the tests are pretty, pretty burdensome, they require a lot of resources, they, um, they're not quick enough. The best form of assessment happens at the moment of misunderstanding. If you can provide that instant feedback to a student to say, oh, you did it this way, but the correct way to do it is this way, that instant feedback will shape their learning. And then you don't have to wait three months or six months to give them a test at the end of the year that 60% of them will fail. So I'm not a big fan of the current testing paradigm under Smarter Balance uh, testing. Um, so as a board director, my hope would be that I could help navigate the district through that delicate balance of being in compliance with state and national rules while still providing parents the freedom to opt out and not providing pressure and guilt trips that you have to test your student. So now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. Uh, people can ask anything they want. These are one-minute answers. Uh, Sarah and Liz. Uh, you mentioned your kind of curriculum nerd, that you like curriculum and uh, particularly math curriculum. What is your view on Common Core and some of the other standards? Um, on Common Core, I can't have a view, and I can't really have it in a minute, because it's not, it's not a yes or no thing. Common Core has some really great aspects and some really terrible ones. Uh, really terrible is the loss of control. Um, really good is the focus on learning targets. And so never before has, has there been such an emphasis on learning targets. We've had learning standards for decades, but most people didn't even know it. Parents would say, what? We have standards? So that overarchingly is a good thing. It provides that transparency into what students are supposed to learn. But the implementation of it at the national level, trickling down to the state level, um, I feel that it's really restrictive. And the way it's turning into um, basically an assessment, it, it's all about the test now. So that's, I think, a, uh, one of the, the big downsides of Common Core. Please. 
So I realize that you are running in District 2, but this matters to the entire school board, and it's been difficult. We need a North Downtown School. We've had two failed campaigns through the Downtown Seattle Association, and as much as I respect John Schools, that's about all I'm going to say about his campaigns. Um, so I have a parade of people to me, um, to my house, and uh, I'm in North Downtown School because I'm I can't keep looking at these parents, and I can't keep watching these people not be able to move into the neighborhood, and I also sit in design guidance and listen to developers tell me <clears throat> they can't build two and three bedroom apartments because mm -hmm. we don't have an elementary school. So I am here entreating you, um, and I, I recall meeting up with you basically, but I want to know if I can ask you, if I can call you after the election and ask you to speak with your colleagues again about the North Downtown Elementary in, in my minute, I would say you can call any time. Um, I, I have a lot to learn about capacity management because it's a big beast. I'm studying up on it. Um, I know a lot about my local schools, but citywide, there are a lot of factors at play. During your election campaign, are you willing to uh, divert yourself for an evening and come out to North Downtown and meet some parents there? Sure. Okay. Great. So, uh, Mary, and then I have a question. Speaking of capacity, uh, there's the possibility that there's going to be uh, expectation about reduced class sizes. And do you have any suggestions for how the district Um, I don't have specific suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that from a capacity management point of view, I'd like to step back just a little bit and get more demographic information from the city, a little bit better mm -hmm. longer term planning so that we see these things coming. Because mm -hmm. I've had people tell me, no, we don't have a capacity, man or capacity problem. And I've had other people say, well, why are you know, all of my classes in portables? And uh, I think it's a, a little bit of a mix of um, insufficient facility planning and uh, you know, just a logistical mess. I'm trying to get ramped up quickly for something that we probably should have seen a few years in advance. Um, so I have a question then Renee and Sarah. So uh, how do you view the school board's relationship with the superintendent? We hire the superintendent, we review the superintendent. Um, you know, from a policy point of view, it's very clear what the board does and what the superintendent does. From what I've seen in the last five years, the relationship between the board and the superintendent really determines how the public perceives that dynamic and how satisfied the superintendent is in their position. Um, so I think that the public perception or the board, I guess the at the, at the actual meetings, the communication, the voting, those discussions um, are generally friendly and, and very positive. Um, what I would like to, I'd like to think that I, I play well with others and I would bring that mentality to my direct communications with this superintendent and could um, help influence his thinking outside of the, uh, the structure of, of uh, governance. Name, sir. So you talked about teachers and you know institutional uh, instructional materials, but what kind of appetite do you have for encouraging other support systems in these schools that would help kids achieve success, such as family support workers, counselors, nurses, that kind of thing that hasn't been really discussed very much lately. Um, I've I've read amazing stories about the value of, of these of these people of the counselors, um, and then I've also heard firsthand stories from people about oh yeah we have a counselor at our school that fill in the blanks. So I think the the challenge is getting the right people in those roles, and uh, really making sure that we encourage those passionate people to stay in those roles and provide them the support. Uh, 
because I know that for a lot of the disadvantaged students, those are that level of attention, that level of focus really makes the difference. I want to say that in addition to the personal touch, I'm going to go a little bit off script here and say that the I talk about this teachers, students, instructional materials, but I've got some other things, other pet projects, for example, you know, that engage kids and keep them in school. You know, ideas around the arts, bring the wood shop back. You know, some of these things that are outside of reading, writing, math, um, to make sure that we can actually have a little bit broader uh, educational experience for our kids. And, and something that makes them want to come to school. Uh, Sarah, then Clayton. Um, discipline has applied as somewhat of a hot topic in schools, particularly um, I think there's criticism that suspensions and expulsions are disproportionately applied to those disadvantaged communities or um, kids of color that you were talking about. So do you see this as an issue, and what solutions do you have? I see this as an issue, but I'm going to honestly say that I don't have the experience to have solutions for it yet. Um, it's, it's absolutely an issue, and I think it's, yeah, I really just don't have, have a, I, I can't talk up a solution without a better understanding of you know, what are the support systems in place. Thanks. Uh, Clayton, then Maria. I'm curious um, what your view of foreign language instruction is with respect to other curricular demands, foreign languages require work, and that is a positive thing mm -hmm. in school. So, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, because since you say work is a positive thing, I will say that I believe that one of the things that's slipping a little bit in schools is the work ethic. I'd like to see more emphasis on you know, pride in workmanship and self-motivation from the kids. Um, obviously, that's, that's partly the schools, but a big part of it's the families. In the context of foreign language, um, I, I definitely support it. As uh, I took three years of French, which I forgot most of, but when I travel, I've been in France and thought, oh, it's in there. And it's one of those things, there's so many things that you learn in high school that once you move on to college or a, or a more specialized thing, you will never come back and learn those things again. Some of the things in foreign language, some of the social studies, you know, depending on which path you go down, that's your chance to get it. And if you don't get it in your brain then, you never will. So I support that. Uh, Maria? Hi, you said something that I kind of sounded kind of, you know, like, well, you said that you believe in the concept of testing is sound, mm -hmm. but then you said you asked your daughter to opt out of testing, and that you felt that the tests were burdensome, but they're not quick enough, like the way the feedback is when you give it to a student. But, um, so that kind of sounds like you like testing, but you opted out, so I kind of didn't understand that. We'll have a double standard. Yeah, and then, you know, giving immediate feedback and testing are not mutually exclusive, so you True. can still do both. Could you explain why? Yeah, I guess I would like to say that you know focusing the the majority of our efforts on the classroom assessments, mm -hmm. classroom based assessments for that more immediate feedback that really informs the teachers and informs the instruction. But then for the summative testing, um, instead of using things like SBAC, um, to use something that's much more nimble. Um, you know, people say that fill in the, the bubble sheet tests mm -hmm. don't measure the same level of learning. But the correlations show that, yeah, it's not the same level of learning, but it's much faster, and it's not bad. Um, so I'm, a, I'm a, more of a proponent of a simpler test model. So testing, but a different test? Testing, but a different streamlined test okay. that doesn't have as much impact on learning time. Perfect. So we're about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Um, I don't have anything prepared. I just want to say thanks for having me and the great questions and good discussions. Um, I will say that as, as I talk to more and more people on the school board candidate trail, I'm realizing and learning what a machine the Seattle Schools is. And the further insight you get, the more you realize what a complicated machine it is with many moving parts. So the engineer in me is super excited <laughs> to, uh, to go in and fiddle with the moving parts and see how we can really get it optimized. Thanks right. a bunch, and I hope you will endorse my campaign. Thank you.
Thank you very much.